glad you brought up Mills. See, right, Mills. People aren't familiar with him. He was a, a, a sociologist, a philosopher in the 1950s. He was one of the first who really spoke against the Cold War uh, structures. You know, uh, not just the McCarthyism, but like the, the lunacy of it, the madness of it. And it's the, the term he used to describe these people who still populate Washington, D.C., are crackpot realists. Yeah. And I think you get there when you get there and you're around these people and they are they have a veneer. They have some type of bona fides that they are um, uh, uh, some form of experts or that they are true public servants or, you know, some type of of of, of glistening or covering over them that makes them shine for the media and shine for for those who are their sycophants. But when you meet them, they are absolute crackpots. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you do. Sure, I, mean, I, had, yeah. I had to interview them. I mean, I had to deal yeah. with Robert Kagan and Elliot Abrams when I covered the war in El Salvador. And they're l lunatics. I mean, yeah. uh, they, they, all they did, uh, they spent all of their time, Kagan, they were both in the State Department, was attempting to lie and discredit what it was we were, uh, we who were on the ground were reporting. Uh, Victoria Newland. Yeah, they're complete, uh, they're nutcases. But they're lavishly funded by the war industry. Their think tanks are lavishly funded right. by the war industry. It doesn't matter how many times they're wrong, and they've been wrong going all the way back to Central America, wrong about Iraq, wrong about Libya, wrong about Afghanistan. It doesn't matter, uh, but they're perpetuated because they're funded. Uh, right. And, and uh, the media has really just collapsed. So every opinion you have on intelligence matters or military matters is given to you by pundits like Clapper, who should be in jail for perjury, right. uh, and these figures uh, who are all pulling down God knows how much money uh, sitting on the boards of Raytheon and everything else. So, yeah, it's the system itself uh, is, is now so corrupt and so broken. Uh, and reform is not going to come from inside the Democratic Party. It's not. Uh, the, the, the Democratic Party is culpable uh, and the tragedy of the Biden administration is this, this was probably the last chance uh, to, because when these Christian fascists, and, and Trump has no ideology, it was just that ideological void was filled by Christian fascism. When these people come back into power, whether it's Trump or Pompeo or Cotton or DeSantis, I don't know who it is, the, ven the level of vengeance this time around is going to be uh, really uh, awful. I mean, first they'll go after the establishment Democrats. That's the primary target, but then they're going to go after the rest of us. Yeah, uh, um, you've been very clear about that and, uh, um, you know, not not hedging back, not, you know, because it is it, to, to, to go that far to, to, to speak the way you do uh, and to make it clear that there is a real danger here. And like like what I saw with the Brown, Brown uh, the Proud Boys yeah. this past weekend, their discipline, uh, that's what scared me. Because uh, I've seen that before. I've seen men who are ready to do violence if they have the right leadership and who will hold until they're told to do that. And that is something that is very different than what I've encountered at other protests. I've been going to protests for a number of years now with, um, uh, you know, Veterans for Peace and, and other groups. And even too, when I, when I was in Palestine a number of years ago and we got into confrontations with the settlers there, and those are dangerous people. They're all armed and they're very dangerous and they're, they believe the magic real estate agent in the sky has told them that this land is theirs and they will kill people to keep it. But they are not as disciplined. They were not as organized no. as what I saw the other day. No, they're they're it, overweight losers from Brooklyn, largely with an uh, M16 kind of barely strapped to their very large stomachs. Uh, that's that's that you're not. He's not joking, folks. I mean, uh, he, that's exactly what I was picturing. I was describing that because those are the people that we were getting into uh, basically fistfights with. Yeah, I mean, the 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 uh, as you know, I mean, I went into. Kuwait in the first Gulf War, with first battalion, first Marines. Mm -hmm. It was actually a really great unit, and I liked them. Um, and I, but I would never. There was a huge difference between interview. You only, you only do my interviews at night when I'd pull a 19-year-old kid down, and they became human. But once yeah. you put them in a platoon, uh, you know, or a company, uh, especially as we were going into Kuwait, even I mean, I, they weren't going to hurt me, but even I was frightened yeah. uh, because they there's a kind of animalistic or atavistic uh, mass with, with whose sole intent is to kill. Um, uh, I remember I was with the uh, lieutenant colonel, who was a great guy, actually, Vietnam vet, 
and uh, we had a three or four officers come over from the British Army had all gone to Sandhurst and spoke proper English. <laughs> I think he was from Arkansas or Mississippi or somewhere. And just they couldn't deal with the snobbery. It was driving them him crazy. And they were snobs. And I remember when he left, he like suddenly starts breaking down his M16 to clean it. And he mutters, what these people forget is that we're killers. Well, yeah. that's, that's what Marine Corps is very good at. They're killers. That that was, I mean, and I would say that uh, both after being in Afghanistan and Iraq, and it's it's few media presentations that get that correct. But a squad, an infantry squad, an infantry squad, an infantry squad, excuse me, from the U.S. Army, from the U.S. Marine Corps, in the years 2007, 2011, 2013, could kill better than anyone else on the planet yeah. at that point. I mean, that's that, and that was that, and these are 19, 20 year old kids, and we have to remember how they were brought to that point, though. No one goes into the, you, the Army Infantry or the Marine Corps Infantry um, and is just a killer. It is done through a scientifically and academically validated process that takes months, if not years, to get those young men to that point. You know, they spend, if you're a young man, going, or now a young woman, I guess, going into the Marine Corps Infantry, you spend 13 weeks at recruit training, and then you're going to go for another 10 weeks or so to infantry training, and then you're going to go to your unit, like 1-1, you know, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, and you're going to spend your entire enlistment, the next three years or so, simply training to kill. Nothing else matters. That's all you do. Yeah, you might do some classes on some other things, might change oil on a Humvee now and again, but that is what you're going to do. And understanding that and understanding the ability to harness that, to harness that that uh, uh, power to control that force within particularly, say, young men is something that I think you've been pointing out. And again, like what I saw with the Proud Boys, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's something that... Um, I don't think we fully appreciate where we can be at right in the next coming years uh, in terms of, of how quickly uh, things can escalate. But then also too the power of the charismatic leader, right? The power of, of the demagogue, the power of, you know, in, in Donald Trump, we talk about him ad nauseum, but I think it's important because Trump has given um, a, a meaning and purpose to so many people who didn't have that meaning and purpose. And of course, it's a wash in racism and nationalism in this fraudulent religious uh, uh, ethos. One of the things the Proud Boys were wearing on their t-shirts, it said, religion is our heritage, right? So they're fusing all this together, right? I mean, most of them probably couldn't tell you what the, three, the first three books of the Bible were, but they wear that on their t-shirts. You know, so, you know, I, I want to ask you a question because one of my one of the folks on our, our campaign had this about Trump. Uh, um, and he, he, he says, um, uh, Chris writes Empire of Illusion. Before, Chris wrote Empire of Illusion before the specter of Trump was ever part of the political landscape. But the rise of Trump plays right into the rise of the spectacle, which he discusses in the book. Trump was even on pro wrestling shows for WWF. Is Trump a byproduct of spectacle or the spectacle itself? And what effect does that have on our democracy? And I think we're leading into that with what I was just saying there. But Trump just the echo chamber. He didn't, he doesn't, he's not very bright. Uh, he, he couldn't think anything, any of these ideas himself. He's essentially parrots back what he hears on right wing radio, word for word, literally. If you mm. go back and look at Savage or Limbaugh or any of these other people, Trump just steals it. And it got to a point where it was so blatant, they were just sending him talking points throughout the campaign. Uh, so yes. that, that Trump tapped into, in the same way Slobodan Milosevic did, who was a banker. And he there's this clip, which is probably on YouTube, of him in Kosovo. And he says to these Serbs in Kosovo, which was uh, Serbs only, were only about 10% of the population in Kosovo, the rest were Kosovo Albanians. He said, I won't let them beat you. And you can see not only the crowd come to life, uh, but the light mm. go off. Uh, and uh, so all of these figures, very mediocre figures, Radovan Karadzic was uh, loony, uh, but, but they, they essentially fed back to an enraged, disenfranchised population what they wanted to hear. And that's precisely how Trump operated. Uh, he, uh, he, he's a product of right wing radio, uh, yeah. and, uh, there's every idea that he 
disseminated, including the wall. That all came from right wing radio, all of it. Uh, and uh, he just politicized it in essence. Uh, but there's a bit of kind of being there to Trump. I mean, this guy is really low wattage. Uh, um, but like classic demagogues, including Hitler, I mean, Hitler was very poorly educated and didn't speak proper German. And that's why the, everybody laughed him off. Uh, but uh, they, they knew how to tap into this uh, rage that was yeah. uh, rippling across a population uh, and articulate it, uh, but they didn't, they didn't, uh, you know, even with the Nazis, they were uh, uh, tapping into uh, fringe elements and, and the way that they, I mean, Stryker and all sorts of others uh, with that uh, uh, fascist newspaper, Der Stormer, I think it was called. So uh, th that's what demagogues do. Demagogues habitually are never very bright. Um, they're just kind of astute, it, emotionally astute at tapping into the particular zeitgeist uh, of uh, a disenfranchised segment of the population and, and fueling the fires. Uh, right. So that's what Trump did. Uh, we don't, it may not be Trump. Uh, it looks like he's going to run, who knows, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and you read Kershaw's biography of Hitler and he said, you know, if it wasn't Hitler, it would have been somebody else. Uh, yeah. which I think I buy in the kind of distortions of Weimar and the distortions of the United States. If it's not Trump, it'll be someone else. The difference is this, when this time around, they won't play nice. I mean, they, you know, yeah. you may think they didn't play nice before, but they really won't play nice. They will just dynamite every institution uh, that uh, potentially offers any ability to resist and they will crucify, first they'll crucify among the hierarchy, though, I, I'm, you know, so I'm not at the top of the list. You're not at the top of the list, uh, but it, it's going to be really ugly uh, and they will use violence or at least the threat of violence. I think you can argue they're already using the threat of violence. Um, th there will be nothing if they get back into power. It's going to be, I, I think, at that point, uh, talking about American democracy, which I don't think exists. But I think then you're really talking about a kind of naked Victor Orban. Yeah. Uh, you know, type of uh, autocracy or in our case, probably a Christian fascism. It will wear the veneer of Christian fascism, which the Trump administration did. That Christian fascism filled the ideological void. Um, you had so many figures, Barr, uh, Pence, Pompeo, uh, Betsy DeVos. They all came out of this movement. Now, those were the, the, the very public faces that you saw, but they were seeding within the bureaucracy all sorts of uh, stalwarts within the radical Christian right from Patrick Henry Law School and Liberty University and everything else. So, uh, you know, the tragedy is that we had a particular historical moment when we could have responded in a very real way uh, to this suffering. Uh, when I finished my book, American Fascists, I came to the conclusion, I spent two years on that book, and I should add, I I'm a graduated from Harvard Divinity School. I'm biblically literate, which was an asset because I understand how they distort and use right. the Bible. I mean, I call them heretics, which they are. Uh, so I was probably, because I'm biblically literate, probably more attuned to how they manipulated the Bible to serve their political agenda. But I came to the conclusion that the only hope was to reintegrate these people economically into the society. If we didn't do that, we were finished. That was the conclusion of the book. Well, of course, it's gotten worse. It doesn't, it, it's gotten much worse.